I'm here nearly two years now and I felt it shouldn't just be people who read the art section in the newspaper. And I wanted people who feel it's their house, it's their museum. I'm Kay Brown, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. If you're around the art world, you'll likely be familiar with the name Klaus Biesenbach. The German-born curator began to make his mark in Berlin back in the 1990s, founding the city's biennial and one of its key art institutions, Kunstwerke. Sometime after that, he moved west, taking up a directorship at MoMA PS1 and a chief curator position at the MoMA in New York, before moving west yet again, this time to become director at MoCA LA. As a curator, Klaus has gained a reputation for leveraging the power of people and celebrity, working with artistic stars like Marina Abramovich, as well as art-adjacent creatives like musicians Patti Smith and Bjork. He's known for creating and capturing social moments and for platforming performance art, and ultimately using both of these forms to rethink the social nature of museums. For the past two years, he's been back home in Germany, heading up two of the country's most important museum projects in a post that he called a -a once-in-a-lifetime honor. One museum is a highly symbolic historical treasure, the Neue Nationalgalerie in Berlin, a 1960s architectural icon designed by Mies van der Rohe. The other is a museum still to come, the Berlin Modern, which is set to open its doors right next to the Neue Nationalgalerie in 2026. I checked in with Klaus just as he was closing a major retrospective dedicated to artist Isa Genskin, and while the foundation is being laid at the Berlin Modern. Hi Klaus, it's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. How are you today? Thank you, Kate. I am really enthusiastic today because we had half an hour of sunshine in Berlin. It's always main news. Everybody's posting on social media when the sun is out for a moment. (laughs) I know. And it was snowing here. I'm also in Berlin. It was snowing here yesterday and it was very endearing to see these like tiny little muddy snowmen all over Berlin. It's a very iconic element of the winter here (laughs) because they're a little bit gross. Absolutely. It's very rare. (laughs) Yeah. On that note, I was also imagining, I didn't see it yesterday, but you were taking down Isa Genskin's monumental 1993 rose sculpture, and it must have also been encrusted with some snow as you were deinstalling it. This was a public sculpture that was outside of the museum until this week when your retrospective on the artist had its finissage. And so, you know, we're going to cover a lot of ground today and speak about many different aspects of the museum and also the new museum that you're building, which I'll explain a bit later. But I did really want to start in this present of the Easy Genskin show, which was such an acclaimed exhibition. And even the rose, which, you know, was such an element of magic in front of the museum. And I actually will miss it very much when it's gone. So can you tell me a bit about the finissage that you had on Monday, which was on the occasion of her 75th birthday, which very much fits into the theme of the retrospective that you curated? Yeah, my co-curator Lisa Botti and I, we decided to do an exhibition that has 75 works of sculpture, 75 sculptures by Isa Genskin. And we wanted to do it this year because she's turning 75. She did turn 75 on Monday. And first we thought the exhibition is more like an artist-artist show. It won't have much of attraction. But we actually had lines around the block. There was one Sunday where we had a line all around the museum to get in, which was really very fulfilling to see that such a strong body of work by Isa Genskin finds such an acceptance and such openness in the audience. That was really wonderful. And on Monday, we closed the exhibition. We had this beautiful rose that is 24 feet tall, as tall as the Mies Glass Pavilion, And it was immediately accepted by the city. People said, oh, let's meet in front of the Rose. And we had a performance by Casey Spooner there. So it really became a center of the city and it became the place to meet and the place to photograph. And so this was dismantled the last two days. It's gone. Very sad. I just arrived and I miss it already. But we did inaugurate Full Moon, Full Moon, a work from Isa Genskin that she originally did for the sculpture project Münster. And it's a 45 feet tall moon. It's about 10 feet in diameter. 
And it looks like a full moon. It really has the structure, the stains, the texture of a moon, and it's lit at night. So we opened this on Monday. We had a children's choir saying the moon is rising. Der Mond ist aufgegangen. Moon has risen. And while they were singing, moon has risen, it started to snow. It was quite a magical moment. So we had snow, we had the moon, we had joy, but we also were sad to see the show go. It was also a full moon on Monday. I feel that couldn't have been planned more perfectly. <laughs> we didn't plan it, but sometimes things coincide, yeah. There were some very, very beautiful photos of the full moon and the full moon. Yeah, I saw Wolfgang Tillmans, the photographer, who was a good friend of Isa's, also took some photographs of the exhibition. I mean, just to say that this show, it meant a lot to the city. And as an extension of that, this museum means a lot to Berlin. I was there on the weekend, actually, because there's been the major rehang of the permanent collection, which we'll chat a bit about in a moment. Just to second what you were saying, I was so impressed by like the amount of people there. And it is such an international scene. You're hearing so many different languages, but you're also hearing Berlin accent. And I wondered if you could speak a bit about this overlapping audience membership and how that fits into the purview of the institution and if it's ever contradictory in some ways to satisfy these two audiences. The main traffic artery of Berlin, the Potsdamer Straße, it's really a main traffic artery. At some point, they thought they have to make a highway out of it because everybody <laughs> going from west to east, from north to south, has to basically find their way through this very corner of the city, this very detail of the city. So everybody's driving by, which is quite beautiful. It's a museum that everybody sees driving or walking or bicycling by every day. So in a beautiful way... We have the TV tower, it's the TV tower, and we have the museum, and it's the museum, and that's our museum. And it's such a public building, and it's such a public image. I had the great artist Florentina Holzinger, who does performance art and theater, and she also used to be a skateboarder, and I had her over in summer to think about future performance ideas. And she basically said, oh, I know this building for all of my life, but it took years into studying being an artist that I understood under the glass pavilion is a huge museum. So it's a very visible museum, but you only see the Mies van der Rohe glass pavilion that is very like a beacon in the city. It's beautiful when it's lit at night. And because people see it driving by, it has a very low threshold or well, we are trying to even have the threshold lower. We have like free Thursday evenings and we have music programs and we do festivals and we do vigils. So we're trying to open the house. So I think when you visit Berlin, it's definitely on the list for every tourist to have a look at. But it's also on the bucket list for every Berliner on a nice weekend. So that makes it a very special place where. Berliners and visitors to the city and a very diverse audience. I'm here nearly two years now and I felt it shouldn't just be people who read the art section in the newspaper. And I wanted people who feel it's their house, it's their museum. And I think we are working as a team in the National Gallery very much realizing this and reaching out to different audiences. And that's what you describe as this beautiful mix of foreigners and foreign languages and Berliners. What is one thing that I think is unique in Berlin is the audience. I think one of the most beautiful things about working in the art world in Berlin is the audience. It's a very curious, it's a very educated, it's a very sophisticated, it's a very diverse audience that knows a lot, but is also really open to perceive new things. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite unique. Yes, and the collection reflects the history here, which means obviously so much to so many people. And I want to ask you a bit about the collection, because I know you've been working to sort of develop it as much as is possible. To sort of speak a bit further about what's on view at the museum right now, 
as an as important part of the collection, Gerhard Richter, the artist who, of course, every German knows and arguably many people in the world know, he has a permanent loan that has been handed over to the museum. And his work is on view in the underground section of the museum, which is sort of the largest part of the museum above the glass pavilion, as you mentioned. And I thought it was really interesting, although perhaps it was like the full moon, it was sort of serendipitous, but not on purpose, that Isa Genskin and Gerhard Richter were both on view at the same time. They obviously had a relationship, they were married, but also these are two artists that really like sit in the public consciousness of the German public. They challenged modern art in very distinct ways. They challenged the status quo in very distinct ways. I'm curious how you read this parallel presentation and if it was planned or wasn't planned and how it came off to you. It wasn't planned, but it's also not a complete coincidence because I think both of the artists are groundbreaking internationally acclaimed, internationally innovative and influential artists. So Gerhard Richter, I'm pronouncing this deliberately in German and not in my German-American accent. Gerhard Richter Kunststiftung is basically a foundation that the artist and the family gave to the National Gallery to be here on long term. So we're building a museum next door. It will be housed there. So this is here as part of the collection for the long run. And Isa Genskin was a momentous but very important retrospective on the occasion of the 75th birthday. And what was so interesting is that seeing the exhibition Isa Genskin 75, 75, 75 sculptures for the 75th birthday, it was purely chronological. You have this vast Mies open space that's 24 feet tall and it's several hundred feet wide. And we just placed like a grid, we placed the sculptures in a chronological order and it's a vast space. So there was a lot of space that every sculpture inhabited and had its presence in and we only allowed 75 people at any given time. So for each sculpture, one person. For one person, one sculpture. And somehow that really communicated really, really well that it was like you go into a room and you introduce yourself to 75 people. You look at 75 faces and you try to study them. It led to the most incredibly attentive contemplating audience I've ever experienced. And fingers crossed, knock on wood, we put all the sculptures on the ground without pedestals and without stanchions. And I have to say for the whole time the exhibition was on and still now while I talk, it's being deinstalled. So I still have a little bit of a heartbeat when I talk about it. <laughs> the fragility of the work is part of the work. And somehow it commanded a certain attention that made people very cautious, but also very attentive contemplating the work. This was quite a magical moment. I've never seen such a focused, respectful, curious audience. It was quite beautiful. I was at the press preview for the show, so I was among the lucky ones who got to see it before the public had gone in. I remember you and the curators being a bit nervous about how the audience would react, but ultimately just trusting the public that they would have a good reaction among this space. And it sounds like it really resonated with people. And I think that that trust and giving that responsibility over, it was a really good gesture of good faith with the German public and the Berlin public, also the international public. But we also didn't count on it being a popular show. We thought it will be a show that's well attended, but we didn't think that the capacity would be a problem. So it turned out, surprise, surprise, it was a big audience success and there was a line always to get in. But people were very respectful. They didn't overstay their visits. They made place for the next person in line. And I remember when we did Marina Abramovich, the artist is present at MoMA, that chair across from her was meant to be empty. We always envisioned it to be empty. We never thought there would always be people sitting there. And so I never imagined that there would always be a person in front of each sculpture. But it literally was the case in Isa Genskin's show, it was always as many people as there were sculptures. And it was a constant flow. And it was like a conversation people had with the work. I was surprised. We didn't conceive it this way, but it worked out beautifully. Hmm. 
Well, it doesn't surprise me in the sense that performance and creating social spaces is a very big focus in your curatorial practice. And I believe it was at the MoMA you co-founded the Performance and Media Department. You also started the PS1 warm-up outdoor summer series. And so I think you've been bringing this to the Neue National Gallery, focusing on a more reactive program that is ephemeral, more socially focused, activating different parts of the museum. And I'm interested in how this experience has been, you know, almost two years into your tenureship. Has there been some challenges in kind of loosening up the social or symbolic architecture of Berlin museums or German museums as compared to U.S. ones? Before I arrived, there was COVID. I arrived at the same time Omicron arrived in Berlin. So there was no <laughs> welcome party or welcome reception or whatever because everybody's wearing a mask. And so there was a very cautious, very slow-moving audience openness there because we were all going through an unprecedented health crisis. And the museum had just been reopened after years of renovation. So the museum was closed for years. Then there was COVID and I arrived during COVID. So the very first programs that I perceived when I came to the museum, it was many people who wanted to see their museum again. And I actually felt I was a relatively young person amongst other people when I was in the galleries. And I think our whole team here was very eager to approach new audiences. So we had a Monica Bonvicini exhibition that my colleague curated that brought in a much more youthful, a much more playful crowd. And we had programs that were from specific, for example, we had what was very interesting. We had Yoko Ono's cut piece reperformed and Yoko Ono, who is born in 1933. So she turned 90 this year. But a cut piece is from the 1960s, so it's really a modern masterpiece. And with the studio, we had it re-performed. Not re-performed, I should say we had it performed. And these are moments where I think the Berlin audience, or any audience, it's interesting. It's a new situation to have a historical piece to be experienced in the here and now, and not only as a black and white film or video. And it grew day after day and more and more people came to see it. And the last day of the cut piece performance, we didn't know where to put the audience. It was so crowded. So I think it's a growing and it's learning from each other. We are learning from the audience and the audience is learning with us, with the artists, which is nice. I guess it's an audience that you also used to know, although I would like to ask you about how it's been changing in a wider sense. So as you mentioned, you returned to Berlin two years ago. You were living here in the 1990s. You were you know, a key figure in the post-wall scene, having founded Cave Institute for Contemporary Art, which is one of Berlin's most beloved contemporary art institutions by now, as well as Berlin Biennial. I wanted to ask you, coming back after so many years away, is this audience that you've just so beautifully described, is it a fundamentally different one than it was before? The 1990s were a fundamentally different time. Everything seemed to be possible. And being in Mitte, where the Berlin Biennial, Café Bravo by Dan Graham and the KW Institute for Contemporary Art still are, was a place of so many changes and opportunities and so many artists. There were a lot of abandoned buildings and large abandoned buildings and industrial spaces and an old department store. And artists took over because they took over. They had not much to move in. They could start their studio or gallery. And I think my experience in the 1990s was an extremely positive starting point of so many artistic careers when we did the first Berlin Biennial. It was mostly artists living in Berlin and there was so much artistic production going on and so many important pieces were created in that period. So I can't compare this historically unique moment after the wall fell with the reality now. So I left after a little bit more than a decade here in Berlin to go to New York and I left Berlin as a bud of a flower. So it was about to blossom. Everybody felt. And Berlin is very different now. Berlin is different in terms of, for example, 
I left and there were three functioning airports and I come back and there's not a single airport anymore that really functions and has international <laughs> direct flights. And it sounds a little exaggerated, but it's not really exaggerated. So I went to Paris Plus at Basel in Paris and you felt everybody from around the world was in Paris to see these incredible exhibitions all in all museums. And I don't even go so much to the fair. I go to the museums that accompany a fair. And there was very, very, very few people, despite the fact that it's geographically so close, that found their way to Berlin because I was sending emails, oh, please come and see the Insagenskin show. That would have been different in the 90s. In the 90s, everybody would have come from Paris. Oh, we are in Europe anyway. What Berlin has now is a more longer-term international audience, people who are choosing Berlin as a place to learn, to study, to live for a few years. And it's people who choose Berlin or it's people who also come with a migration background because that's also something in Berlin that's very, very important. Berlin seems to be much more in the East than when I was here in the 90s. Berlin feels a little bit the furthest point East where you feel like in a stable democracy. You feel like in a stable environment and of course, there's Poland, and of course, Poland is a great country. But I think in terms of civil liberties and the understanding that democracy might be stable, I think Berlin is a very important point for people to look for a stable environment to study or to live for a while. Because just after I arrived, you might remember the Ukraine war started, and there it was. It was the cities together with Poland, but it was a country and the city that felt geographically close, but also safe and free. But it's a different role than this artistic field of experimentation of the 90s. It's much more a city that feels like it is rather than it's about to become. When I was in Berlin in the 90s, everybody says, oh, Berlin is poor, but sexy. And now it's poor, but expensive. So there is a lot of tension that comes with that, that people have to think about. And for a person coming from the US, for better or for worse, there is a lot in American society that plays between generosity and gratitude. Generosity is sharing and also sharing your own success or sharing what you have or sharing a smile when you go to a store in the morning. And gratitude is that you are grateful that somebody is sharing something and that somebody is smiling at you in the store in the morning. And this generosity and gratitude is very important background or very important attitude that comes with daily life. Germany is a very, very rich country but people don't feel rich. And that's actually surprising. So I think at the moment, Germany feels a little bit stuck and paralyzed. But perhaps the whole world is at a moment to reconsider who we are and where we are and how we want to live. Perhaps it's only for me that I came from the US in a moment during COVID still, then the Ukraine war happens. So there's so much in tectonic shifts happening. You can't really localize it. You feel it in Berlin. You do feel the Ukraine war in Berlin. You do feel migration. You do feel that the world is a little bit questioning everything at the moment. I think that's, that's something very present in daily life. Also, sustainability and the climate crisis is something that is much, much more tangible. It's much, much more your everyday life that you think about the climate crisis. And it's not like I came from California where you have the drought or you have the earthquakes or you have fires or you feel like nature is kind of really present in these dramatic events. That is not so tangible here. But the climate crisis as an imminent threat is very obvious and very present on people's mind.
As you say, there is an immediacy to the sort of political landscape and you feel it in Berlin. And I certainly know what you mean. We're speaking in a time as well where the city is also very divided over issues of freedom of expression. There's also the war in the Middle East, which has a big impact on the political scene here. You know, as you mentioned, the war in Ukraine, which is still unfolding. And there's, again, the climate crisis in the background of all that. I mean, even just looking at these three issues, what is museums role at this time? How do you respond to this and how should you respond to this? I think the museum has to be a safe space for people who look for a third space that's not their job and not their home. We, for example, yesterday with Isa Gensken leaving, the exhibition leaving the building, we started our Wärme Café again, which is like a cafe where people can just come and have a coffee for free. And it's very cold. It's only November, but it's like freezing temperature here. So we want to offer the museum as a safe space that is not work-related, that's not consumption-related. We want to have the museum as a safe space for everybody to come. When you look through the collections right now, you reflect the second half of the 20th century. We had the first half of the 20th century before this as a collection hang, and it felt like strangely reminiscent of the times we're in with inflation, the war, and glitter and doom in the 1920s. Now, Extreme Tensions is the title, Zerreißprobe is the title of the collection hang. And again, it feels like a very timely hang, but it was planned for over a year. And the collection in Berlin is quite unique because you had a national gallery in the East and in the West, while the city was divided. Of course, the West predominantly was also influenced by American or French and British art. And we have a lot of abstraction in our collection. We used to call the main gallery in this museum, we used to call it Americana Saal. So the big hall of the Americans where Rothko and Barnett Newman were. And right now, having also the figuration that was not only in the East, but also in the West, you could say the collection is juxtaposing figuration and abstraction, but it also juxtaposes East Berlin and West Berlin, and it juxtaposes the East and the Western Bloc, and it juxtaposes something that only Berlin can do, because Berlin is a city where only a few hundred yards away was a Berlin Wall, and that was a reality from the early 60s to 1989. Yeah. And as you say, the title of the new rehang, Extreme Tension, is such an impactful pair of words to sort of describe the current moment. And there are so many very unsettling connections that can be drawn across almost a century. Is there one particular work or artist in the collection that you can hone in on that some lessons can be drawn to this political moment right now that we were just speaking about earlier, where questions of freedom of expression and democracy and politics are really like a live wire for people? I think there's a very important work from the 1970s, Schlachtfeld Deutschland, Battleground Germany by Katharina Sieverding from the late 70s. And the late 70s were a time where Germans needed to come to terms with their past, with the Holocaust, with the Nazis, the Nazi terror. And a younger generation wanted to not only come to terms, but also live and work actively through what does it mean to be German? What does it mean to be German as a country that was such a aggressor and was not only in the wars, but also had dictatorship and had the wall built right through the city. So coming to terms with being German is something that also in my own upbringing is very important. And I think that work, Battleground Germany, is describing a little bit how a country comes to terms with its past and tries to reflect that in everyday behavior and everyday life. So that's one work. But then there is also a very important work at the end of the exhibition, Ever is Over All by Pippi Lotti Rist, where a young woman has this flower. And she is walking by parked cars and then she is using this flower, which is, looks like a giant flower, but it's actually made out of steel. And she is trashing the car windows. 
which is another like speaking and being civil disobedient and being outspoken and being right there, which are different works that I think are very important in the collection rehang. And then, of course, there is a work like Barnett Newman that is in its color fields was so provoking when it was first shown here, it got attacked. So I think what the curators, and I'm not one of the curators, the great team of the Neue National Gallery did this. I think nearly every single piece has a story like this, Andy Warhol, Hammer and Sickle, because Hammer and Sickle is when you live, when this building is a few hundred yards where the wall was, Hammer and Sickle have a different meaning. And there is a great Barbara Kruger work next to it where it's basically say our people are smarter than your people. I think in every single juxtaposition, in every single work, it's quite exemplary. Yeah, and I think the collection before was called Art and Society, and both of these shows, which one is a continuation of the other on a time scale, show how much art can be a catalyst and a mirror for social change, but also maintain a kind of open-endedness in its language that, you know, you can continue to find new meaning and context in it. And I think the works you just listed are excellent examples of that. And they're interesting to me as well, because Katarina and Pipilotti are both females. And I remember when you had first started at the museum, one of the things that you had said to me was that there is, you know, a very sorry amount of non-male artists in the collection. I think it was like lingering at 9%. Of course, this is a hard thing to change very quickly, given the budgets of a publicly funded museum. It's a very different model than in the U.S., so could you explain a bit about the collection and its blind spots, which is also a reflection of the problems of German history as well, and what you're sort of doing to try to change that? So when I arrived, the collection had approximately 9% female artists, which is surprisingly low. And the collection rehang right now has about 25% of the artists are women artists. So that's definitely a very, very important point to work on and especially looking forward to building the Berlin Modern. I really want the museum to be half and half when the museum will open, but we don't really have an acquisition budget. The acquisition budget is more like symbolic and we have to look for collections that we get donated or we have to look for yeah, mostly donations. So it's very difficult to proactively steer a collection around when you really don't have the proactive acquisition budgets that you would need to address blind spots like this. It's very important. And I think there is a constant daily practice. And if works get offered to us, we have the priorities that we really, really want to look for the important female artists that we don't have yet in the collection, like, for example, a Kusama or Lee Kressner or like a Helen Frankenthaler or a Louise Bourgeois. This is surprising that we don't have these artists yet, but I hope soon. Mm. And I hope this podcast can help getting us these important <laughs> works. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. What about geographic diversity? Of course, thinking of former German colonies, artists from the global south, how can one work on that? And what is the gap there at the moment? Our collection is really unique because think about that the National Gallery was a more local and less international institution 120 years ago. And then, of course, we had the Kronprinzenpalais. We had this living museum in 1929 under the Linden. But then only a few years later, the Nazis took power and art, modern art, was declared degenerate. And, of course, the museum, the National Gallery, was not the museum to have, quote, unquote, degenerate art. So a lot was the accession destroyed, also through the war. And then after the war, the whole city had to be rebuilt, was, was rebuilt in an eastern and a western in the four areas. And then a wall was built. So even the National Gallery, there was one in the west and one in the east. So accordingly, a very strong influence from the Western National Gallery was American art from the 50s and 60s. 
Our building was built, designed by Mies van der Rohe, opened in 1968. And it was really very, very close to the border, very close to the block, the Cold War divide. And the Eastern National Gallery was much more national, much more local. You have these terms like socialist realism. So it was a very different focus. So I think our collection, by where we are, by it being in Berlin, but also through the history of the 20th century, is very unique. That is also what the collection hang right now says. Extreme tension. It was this tension that had to be divided by a concrete wall. And it still has to be reflected on. So our collection, I think it cannot be our ambition to, in five to ten years, have a global collection that represents the global south, that represents all different areas where artistic production in the 20th century was very important. We cannot achieve that. I think we are focusing on some areas, like, for example, we are doing a big Lucia Clark exhibition. We are looking at architects like Lina Bobardi. We are looking at Latin America from Brazil all the way up to Middle America to Mexico. That's one area where we feel our collection. We have this beautiful Wilfredo Lam here in the collection, where our collection is a good point to continue collecting into these areas. I think with... Japanese and Korean and later to the end of the 20th century, Chinese, modern and contemporary arts. That's one other point where we can, with the existing collection, start a dialogue and start strengthening. So I think this collection cannot be a global collection, cannot represent because we have too many blind spots to fill to be a universal museum. I think in this case, you have to allow yourself to be a unique collection because you had a unique history and to somehow work on that. And for me, the Berlin National Gallery, when you look through the first part of the 20th century, but also now, you walk through these galleries and it always feels like a history lesson. Because history reflects and manifested itself by the collecting museums, by the systems and museums, by the nations, quote unquote, it was the National Gallery of. So no pun mm. intended, but this is really quite unique. Absolutely. And then you're taking this history and also trying to speculate into the future with this museum that you're going to open in 2026. It's such a massive project of imagination and anticipation. And of course, in the way that you were saying earlier that Germans and Berliners have very strong opinions about their museum, the Berlin Modern has also caused lots of different opinions to be thrown around in the newspapers and this kinds of thing. But ultimately, it is going to be a beautiful and large scale museum that is going to hold the 20th century art collection, as you said designed by Herzog and de Muron, costing an exorbitant 450 million euros, but a testament to some of the ambition that is involved in that. And I know that you have been taking people on tours of the site, which broke ground recently, but also have been trying to make some tweaks to the museum planning in as much as you can. So could you speak a bit about the future museum project that you're working on? Yes, yeah, the Berlin modern, we call it modern as in 20th century modern. Berlin is not only a place. Berlin is also a theme. Berlin is also a history. Every city has a unique history, but I think the Berlin history is in terms of the 20th century, a very drastic one and a very telling one and a very extreme one. So trying to build a museum where the 20th century can be shown, I'm actually thinking about between the Mies van der Rohe building and the new building, thinking about actually a chronology that goes from one building into the other. And I'm thinking about it more like a museum campus because we have these great collections, Gemälde, Galerie and Kupferstich Kabinett, which, for example, have some of the greatest European painting and greatest European works on paper collections next door. I see this as a very connecting campus. And we have started initiatives to green the area, to already start making it an urban park. And also, when I was in Berlin in the 90s, everything was like a construction site in the 90s. Robert Smithson partially buried woodsheds, construction site. 
I did tours as if they were land art in the 90s because it was such massive interventions in the city. And having this gigantic 400 feet long and 250 feet wide, and it's 75 feet deep, we have this massive negative space that reminds you of a Michael Heiser <laughs> right next to the National Gallery. So we did tours with artists to show them and to also inspire them. And we started asking artists to develop projects for the construction site so that it's not only a large hole in the city, but it's also a large projection surface where artists can already start thinking and planning. Ah, oh, that's incredible. And so will you be launching those in 2024? Yeah, we are starting in the spring of 2024 with a few artist projects. And so we want to declare the construction side of the museum already somehow function as an art space. And we will start constructing up because first you build a hole so it's going negative, it's going into the ground. And from spring on, it's going up. And that's where we start with the art projects. Can you share a bit about what the Neue National Gallery will be showing in 2024 at this point and some artists that you're planning on working with, if you can reveal any? <laughs> yeah, we're working with Lucy Raven on a project that is similar to the project she had at the DIA Foundation, Ready Mix. Part of it is also concrete. The idea of concrete or what the materiality or the production of concrete is, we are working on an exhibition of Andy Warhol. In a way, Andy Warhol during his lifetime couldn't be shown because Andy Warhol, he died in 1987 in midst or the height of the AIDS crisis. But there is a lot of works that forever stayed in the closet. It's a bit of a coming out, Andy Warhol, Velvet, Rage and Beauty like the book Velvet Rage and Beauty. I think the recent Netflix documentary showed Andy Warhol in a different light, showed Andy Warhol as a queer artist that lived in a straight world. And mm. this show allows these works that from the 50s line drawings to the 60s, 70s and 80s, it was a constant finding form for his idea of longing, desire, and beauty. And all these works will be brought together. So that's our big summer show. And we're also working on a project about Joseph and Baker. And so it's a very diverse group of exhibitions where Lucy Raven is perhaps the most contemporary. And going way back is going to be Joseph and Baker, who was here in the 1920s. And then Andy Warhol, who is an artist who so much influenced German artists, but we show him in a different light. So these are projects we are very much looking forward to. And then we are working on Lucia Clark, a Brazilian modern superhero artist. I think she is such an important beacon of modernism that we will show in a very large scale exhibition in the spring of 25. Fantastic. And then I'm sure in and around those, you will have lots of reactive ephemeral programming, which, you know, I think that's been a major signature of you coming into the museum landscape in Berlin of being able to sort of organize these off the cuff events. So I'm sure there will be a lot more to look forward to as well in between all of those. I think what is very nice is because the museum is so much in the public traffic, everybody who drives by sees it. You could literally start something on a Wednesday and have it ready two weeks later and people will come. And I think we signal to the city, we are open, we have open doors, so you can just come. People could just come for the Yoko Ono or for the Simon Forti or for Margarete de Kersmarka or for seminal performances, Anna Maria Maiolino, like this, where you could just walk in and be part of a performance or grab Chu Kunak who was very close to Potsdamer Straße and we don't want to have this museum be an ivory tower we want to work with the idea that we are open right to the city right to the street so we did a big big performance festival for Art Week and that attracted thousands of people and the international guests who came by they basically said wow you can pull this off but the most amazing thing is you can do 
such a variety of performances. For all of them, you have an audience. That is a unique thing about Berlin, that you have a very informed and diverse audience who really know what they're looking at and who really follow what they're looking at. That's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Such a fertile ground to work with. And I think that the museum architecture itself lends itself to this openness and you and the team have really been leaning into that. Thank you so much, Klaus. It's been absolutely wonderful to chat with you today and check in again. And I look forward to seeing what's next at the museum in the future. And tomorrow we are hosting the 77th birthday of Marina Abramovich here. If you like, come by. <laughs> I know. Yes, I saw your invitation. Two wonderful women to have a birthday in the same week. And of course, you're celebrating both of them at the museum. I just loved it. <laughs> so I'll see you there. <laughs> come by. Wonderful. Bye. Ciao, Klaus. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Carolyn Goldstein. Thanks for listening and see you next week. 